Welcome to Russian History Retold, Episode 158, Leo Tolstoy, Childhood and Boyhood. Last time, we ended the series on life on a Russian country estate. Today, we finally begin discussing the life of one of the greatest writers in world history, Leo Tolstoy. Now, before I get to Leo, I'd like to make an appeal for donations. In April of this year, 2015, it will mark the beginning of the fifth year of this podcast. It has been a journey of passion for me, although one that is becoming increasingly expensive. There are over 6,000 listeners who are keeping up with each episode as it comes out. So if each person were to donate $1, well, it would be easy to cover the expenses for the next five years. Of course, that's an unrealistic of an expectation, so I'd really, really appreciate it if any of you listening would go to my blog page at www.RussianRulersHistory.com and click on the PayPal button and send over whatever you see fit as a donation. I'm doing this so I can avoid looking for a corporate sponsor doing advertising like Audible, Dollar Shave Club, Harry's, or asking for money every episode. I feel that would ruin the general feel of the podcast. Now to those who've already donated, thank you. But thanks for listening to the podcast. So now on to the topic at hand. The death of Ivan Ilyich. Childhood, boyhood, and youth. Family happiness. Sevastopol sketches. The kingdom of God is within you. Haji Murad. Anna Karenina and War and Peace. Writing any one of these, especially the last two, would have been an incredible accomplishment. Writing all of them is an amazing feat. Yet one man did, Leo Tolstoy. Born Lev Nikolaevich Tolstoy on September 9, 1828, into a very well-off noble family at Yasnaya Polyana, Russia. He was the fourth of five children of Nikolai Ilyich Tolstoy and Maria Volkonskaya. The Russia that Leo was born into was in the midst of a massive upheaval. Napoleon had been turned away just 14 years before. The officers of the Russian army had marched all the way to Paris and discovered that their country was a backward nation, steeped in mysticism and reactionary rule. In 1825, the Decemberist revolt occurred, an attempt to overthrow Tsar Nicholas I. It was squashed mercilessly, but the fires of revolution had been stoked, with the explosions set to occur less than 100 years later in 1917. Russia also realized that culturally, it was as devoid of art and literature as its society was backward. But there was an awakening led by one of the most mercurial men in Russian literary history, Alexander Pushkin. His life, which lasted from 1799 to 1837, was a brief comet of genius, cut short in a duel. His works showed for the first time that the Russian language could be used to write beautiful prose, and not just writing it in French. From here, the world of Russian literature would flourish, especially in the hands of one Leo Tolstoy. Unfortunately for the young boy, tragedy struck early on in Leo's life when his mother died on August 4, 1830, after a brief illness when he was just 23 months old. Her death was to haunt him for the rest of his life. There were no pictures of his mother except a silhouette etching, so Tolstoy never knew what his mother looked like, so he had to use his imagination whenever he thought of her, which was just pretty much quite often. Just before his death, he wrote, quote, I walk in the garden and I think of my mother, of Maman. I do not remember her, but she's always been an ideal of saintliness for me. I have never heard a single disparaging remark about her. He went on to say, quote, Felt dull and sad all day. Toward evening, the mood changed into a desire for caresses for tenderness. I wanted, as when I was a child, to nestle against some tender and compassionate being and weep with love and be consoled. 
become a tiny boy, close to my mother, the way I imagine her. Yes, yes, my maman, who I was never able to call that because I did not know how to talk when she died. She is my highest image of love. Not cold, divine love, but warm, earthly love, maternal. Maman, hold me, baby me. All that is madness, but it is true. You can just feel his emotions in that just brief little snippet. Leo Tolstoy had a talent, part of it because of the loss of his mother. His tragedy turned into our gift from him as further evidenced by this memory. Quote, I'm all bound up. I want to stretch out my arms and I cannot. I scream and cry and I hate my own screaming, but I cannot stop. People are leaning over me. I can't remember why. Everything is shrouded in semi-darkness. There are two of them. My screaming affects them. They're anxious. But they do not release me as I want them to. And I scream still louder. He further goes on from his book, Reminiscences, quote, For the first time I became aware of and liked my little body with the ribs sticking out of my chest and the dark, smooth wooden tub and my nurse's sleeves rolled up and the warm, steaming, agitated water and its lapping noise and most of all, polished feeling of the wet rim of the tub when I ran my little hands along it. It is strange and frightening to think that from the day I was born until I was three years old, all the time I was nursing and being weaned, beginning to crawl and walk and talk, however I rack my brains, I can remember nothing but these two impressions. From the child of five to me, there is only a step. From the embryo to the newborn child is an abyss. And from non-existence to the embryo, not an abyss, but the inconceivable. His mother's side of the family were of ancient, noble origin, supposedly all the way back to the legendary Brurich. The Volkonsky family was considered by some to be of a higher level of nobility than even the Romanovs. Such was the place that young Leo was brought into this world. The Tolstoys were no slouches either when it came to nobility. Their claim to fame was the tracing of the roots to that of the mythical noble from Lithuania, Indris. Nikolai Tolstoy writes in his book, The Tolstoys, 24 Generations of Russian History, 1353 to 1983, quote, the nobility were required by Tsar Fyodor Alexeyevich circa 1682 to deposit plain accounts of their ancestry in the archives preserved in the Kremlin. The Tolstoy's account of their origin ran as follows. In 1353, Indris, a man of distinguished ancestry, described as a count in one version, came from the Holy Roman Empire to Chernigov, accompanied by his sons Litvinos in Somnunten, and a force of 3,000 men. The name Indris is the Russian equivalent of Heinrich, or Henry, which suits well his stated origin in the Holy Roman Empire. His first son's name, Litvinos, is in fact an epitaph, meaning Lithuanian. From this, it seems reasonable to deduce that a noble or knightly Henry came from some part of the Holy Roman Empire to take service in Lithuania. There, his two sons were born, and later, after an unspecified stay, they accompanied him further east to Chernigov and Russia. As a young boy, Leo lived upstairs with his sisters, Maria and Dunya, the latter having been adopted by the family. Four of the first five years of his life, he lived blissfully with them. Then he was made to move downstairs with his older brothers. This was a frightening experience to young Leo, but he knew he had to go. When he finally made his way down the stairs, he was taunted by his brothers, as any older siblings might do. He cried, which caused them to call him Blubberpus. But the big fear he faced was the tutor, 
the imposing Fyodor Ivanovich Rozel. Rozel's main objective was to teach the young boys the, quote, language of Goethe, which was German. French was the other language any good Russian noble child was taught, and that task fell to Aunt Toinette. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves, I'd like to step back a moment and leave Leo and his three brothers and go back a bit of time to talk about some of his ancestors and their trials and tribulations, as it's going to give us a better understanding of who Leo Tolstoy was to become as he grew older. The Tolstoy family, as I mentioned earlier, was a noble one, though of somewhat of a lesser level than, say, the Romanovs or the Volkonskis. There were Tolstoys who enjoyed the prestigious service they provided, such as Peter Andreevich, who served as ambassador to Constantinople under Peter the Great. And then there were the problem members, such as uh, Peter Andreevich, who ended his life in prison for conspiring against Catherine the Great. Then we have his grandfather, Ilya, who was the governor of Kazan, a very much sought-after and honored position, which he squandered by his abject corruption, in which his family was very well taken care of. Ilya Tolstoy was quite unconcerned about his mismanagement of the territory, that is, until the Russian Senate appointed a commission to look into the finances. Ilya felt that it was time was up, and he fell ill, very conveniently, you might say, and he died very soon after finding out about the inquiry, some believing he had actually committed suicide. Now, Leo's father, Nikolai Ilyich Tolstoy, was a veteran of the Napoleonic Wars, having joined the army as an 18-year-old boy in 1812. But this was not to be the glamorous stepping stone to greatness that many others of his generation got to enjoy. No, he was captured by the French in 1813, and despite being an aide-de-camp of the powerful General Gorchakov and being made a major, then a lieutenant colonel, he made his way out of the army to help his family in Kazan after his father conveniently fell ill. When he was younger, Nikolai's family adopted a young peasant orphan named Tatiana Alexandrova Ergolskaya, whom they named Toinette. Toinette was to admire and adore Nikolai, who was her age, for the rest of her life. At times, she felt that her cousin as he would be presented to her, would ask her to marry. But alas, this was not to be. He was a man about town who liked nothing better than a good party. But when his father died, the family fortune went into the proverbial dumpster. The family estate was sold, and they moved into a modest apartment in Moscow, a steep drop in prestige and accommodations for the family. Toinette ran the household as her aunt, Nikolai's mother, was in no shape to do much of anything. Due to the fall of the family's fortune, Nikolai's mother begged her son to think about marriage. Then they came upon the near-perfect match. Maria Nikolaevna Volkonskaya, the daughter of a very influential, well-connected, and best of all, wealthy family. I say near-perfect because, uh, you know, for all her worldly charms, she was, according to some reports, quote, homely, almost middle-aged, with the heavy eyebrows and the great fortune. Toinette, still in love with Nikolai, knew that with the family in such poor financial shape, this marriage had to happen, and she encouraged her cousin to go through with it. So on July 9, 1822, Princess Maria Nikolaevna Volkonskaya married Count Nicholas Ilyich Tolstoy. Her dowry was impressive, as it included 800 male serfs, along with the estate as, at Yasnaya Polyana. Before their first anniversary, the first-born boy, Nicholas, came into the world. A year later, Leo's father resigned his position in Moscow and moved to the country estate full-time. The marriage, while a less-than-passionate one, was one of two people devoted to each other and their children. We have letters they sent to each other to show their care for one another. One would start with the words, My tender dear friend, or end with your devoted Maria. Now you may have noticed I've pronounced her name two different ways, Maria and Mariah. 
they're kind of interchangeable from what I've seen. I've seen, you know, with all the different works I've uh, been reading, and they're quite numerous, they pronounce them and write them differently. So I'm going to try to stay with uh, Maria. Now, starting in 1826, and for the next two years after that, Maria had three boys, Sergei, Dimitri, and then, of course, Leo. Maria loved her four boys more than she ever had loved the other men in her life, her father or her husband. On March 2, 1830, she was to give birth to a fifth child, this time a girl who they named also Maria. This was to be the last child she would bring into the world. Quickly after the birth, her health declined rapidly. So on August 4, 1830, she died. Nikolai, deeply saddened by the death of his wife, asked Toinette a number of years later if she might take up the role of his, his wife and mother to the children. She would write, quote, August 16, 1836. Today, Nicholas made me a singular proposal to be his wife and a mother to his children and never to leave them. I refused the first and promised the second as long as I shall live. Back to Leo. As we left off, he now had to join his four brothers and leave the comfort and stability of his time with his younger sisters. The four boys got along quite well, aside from the occasional teasing. Dimitri was the closest to his age, Sergei was next, about two years older, and Nicholas was the oldest, about five years his senior. They had led a very good life, far better than most Russian children. They were surrounded by a number of relatives, aunts, uncles, and of course their grandmother. His aunt, his father's sister, was an odd woman whose husband, one Count Austin Sakin, went crazy and tried to kill her twice. Sent to an asylum when his wife was pregnant, he was to exit the stage, but the trauma to Alexandra Ilyichina was too much, and this was compounded by giving birth to a child. Unbeknownst to her, it was stillborn, replaced by the baby of a peasant woman. The child's name was Pashenka, and she was to live with the Tolstoys. One of Leo's favorite house servants was Praskovya Isavyevna, the housekeeper. She was extremely devoted to the family, so much so that when she saw the papers that were drawn up to give her her freedom, she wailed, quote, I guess you must not like me, mistress, since you're sending me away. Holidays like Christmas and Easter were a joyous time in the Tolstoy house. Relatives from near and far joined together along with many of the house serfs and the country peasants. Even in a house with 32 rooms, privacy was near impossible. But to little Leo, ah, it was a time to be a boy. He looked back at his years as a little boy, pining for a return to those innocent days. Quote, Childhood candor, carefree heart, need to love and faith. Shall I ever find you again? What time could be better than that when the two highest virtues, innocent joy and a limitless need to love, are the only mainsprings of life? Another reminiscence of his youth, quote, I love Nani. Nani loves me, and she loves Mitya. I love Mitya. Mitya loves me, and he loves Nani. And Nani loves Antoinette, and me and Papa. And everybody loves, and everybody is happy. Such was the idealized and very likely real life that Leo Tolstoy led as a young boy. But my favorite line of his from the book Childhood, Boyhood, and Youth, one that I just started reading recently uh, on my iPad, and I got it for 99 cents, so it's out there, it's not expensive, and it's well worth your time. And this is about his time on the country estate and others during his young days, quote, The sounds of voices and hoofs and carts, the gay piercing call of quail and buzzing of insects round, the smell of wormwood tufts and the straw and horses' sweat, a thousand different shadows and colors which the burning sun set off on pale yellow fields, the blue line of the forest and the pink-tinged clouds, 
and the white gossamer floating in the air or lying in the stubble. I saw it all. I heard it. I felt it. Leo was eight, and his older brother Nicholas was fourteen. And the family knew that in order to get a good education and further the boys' chances at a good career, they needed to move away from Yasnaya Polyana. It was time to move to Moscow. On January 10, 1837, the Tolstoy family got together to say a final prayer before setting off on a 130-mile trip over the packed snows of Russia heading to Moscow. Amid the tears of the servants and young Leo, off they set for a new life, one that was very different from the ones that they had led. After a four-day journey, Leo, alongside his father, they entered Moscow. The young Tolstoy was stunned that no one paid any attention to the family as they made their way through the streets. In Yasnaya Polyana, everyone stopped what they were doing to bow their heads to the entourage. Here, in Moscow, no one really cared who they were. As he wrote in his book, Childhood, Boyhood, and Youth, quote, For the first time, it became clear to me that we were not the only people on earth that all the world's interests did not converge upon us, and that there was another life, that of people who had nothing in common with us, cared nothing about us, and did not ever know we existed. After they settled into their new home in the pre Skaya district, young Leo began to write his first stories. Here's an excerpt from his earliest piece, quote, in the town of P, there lived an old man, ninety years of age, who had served under five emperors, who had seen more than one hundred battles, who held the rank of colonel, who had ten decorations paid for in blood, for he had ten wounds, and walked on crutches, having only one leg, and had three scars on his forehead, while one of his fingers, the middle one, had fallen at Brelia. He had five children two little lasses, and three young fellows. He called them, although the eldest had already had four children and four grandchildren. Leo's life of privilege was one where he had the ability to access the creative side of his brain. But things were to change yet again dramatically. When he was only nine years of age in 1837, his father had to attend to a matter in Pirogovo regarding an inheritance of a neighbor. Upon arriving on June 21st, Nikolai Ilyich Tolstoy died in the middle of the street. Because he was found with no money or papers on him, his servants were suspected of murder, but after an inquiry, it was determined that he died of natural causes. The Tolstoy children were now all orphans. Contemplate this. You are nine years old, and you've already lost a mother of which you had no recollection of, except as a heroic and a loving figure. Now you lost your father, someone who you admired and worshipped. The feeling of abandonment must have felt great to the young boy. According to what we know about Leo, because he did not see his father die, he felt that he might reappear at any moment. He just could not fully come to grips with his loss. It could not be true. He could not be an orphan. He was a Tolstoy. Toinette and his two aunts, Aline and Pele Gaia, were to tend to the children. Aline was a very pious woman who prayed morning, noon, and night, where Pele Gaia and Nikolaevna were still a bit crazy, but this was all that the children had. Their grandmother was overcome with grief, so much so that she was seen having conversations with her dead son. At this point, there was a change in the person who was to educate the boys, as the matriarch did not believe that Fyodor Roselle was good enough for them. Beg as he might, Roselle was relieved of his duties and replaced by Prosper de St. Thomas. This strict 25-year-old man was tougher than his predecessor and full of his own importance, which did not really endear him to the children. St. Thomas noted that most of the Tolstoy boys were pretty good students, but Leo, he thought, eh, not so much. 
But there was something in that boy that Prosper saw that was different. He could care less about studying, but his mind seemed to be sharper than his brother's. He had a talent. Just what it was wasn't apparent yet. It would be a few more years before it came out. Before that would happen, tragedy would strike yet again. Aunt Aline, the children's guardian, would die on August 30th, 1841. Leo was just ten days away from his thirteenth birthday, and now he lost his third parent. The choice of the next guardian would be between Pelagaya Yushkov, Nicholas's sister, and Aunt Toinette. In a normal situation, there would be no choice. They'd both help raise the children. Now this, though, was no normal situation, as the two women despised each other. Why might you ask, was there so much animosity between the two? There's a reason. Pelagaya's husband, Vladimir Ivanovich, had been in love with Toinette and asked her to marry him. She was still in love with Nicholas, though, and refused. I remember Pelagaya's brother was Nicholas. Now Vladimir settled on Pelagaya and married her instead. So here we are, with her love, Nicholas's children, going to the care of his sister, who was the wife of a spurned lover. This was just not going to end well. Pelagaya decided that the children would move with her to Kazan, leaving Toinette behind. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Join me next week as I continue the story of one of the world's greatest literary giants, Leo Tolstoy, as he arrives at Kazan for the next phase of his life. So, thank you for listening. We'll see you soon. So now, as always, Das Vidanya. Y спасибо большое.